We are on a journey. We have begun part two of Panorama of the Bible. Part two uh, in this 12 movement section through the whole of Scripture. We are working our way from Genesis to Revelation in 12 distinct movements. We start movement number seven today. This particular movement is the kingship divided monarchy. We begin on page 121 in your workbook. And if you will notice at the top of the page, we have listed the movements to this point. And one of the unique features of panorama of the Bible is that these movements tend to cluster into pairs. You'll notice prologue and patriarchs, that covers the book of Genesis, is our first pair. The third movement is a double movement, redemption and wandering. But then we have four and five, the conquest of the land, and then the falling away while in the land. And then we have six and seven as a pair, kingship united monarchy and kingship divided monarchy. At the bottom of the page, you'll notice our timeline addition goes simply like this. 931 B.C. <clears throat> with the death of Solomon, we have Israel in the north. Israel will continue in the north until 722 B.C. when they will take, be taken away into Assyrian captivity. In the south, Judah will continue until 586 B.C., the destruction of Jerusalem, of the temple, and, uh, and that will, uh, be t they will be taken away into Babylonian captivity. So this is the time of the divided kingdom. If you'll turn the page, I gave you some background material, and you'll notice uh, on that particular page, I have listed the kings of Israel in the north and the kings of Judah in the south. As a matter of fact, the divided monarchy focuses on kings and prophets. That's, prime, that's the primary focus, kings and prophets. And the subject matter is idolatry and judgment. And we will see this unfold from king to king, from prophet to prophet. On the uh, left-hand side, there are 19 kings of Israel. I want you to hear this. They're all bad. The, uh, the, the scriptures indicates that all 19 of the kings of Israel were bad kings. I'll talk about that in a moment. On the right-hand side, there are 19 kings and one queen. Uh, you'll notice if you scan down <clears throat> about seven or so, you'll see Athaliah. Athaliah, the queen who reigned for a short period of time. <clears throat> and, uh, and so we have 19 kings. Most of them are bad. There are a few good ones. For example, Hezekiah is accorded the, that he's a good king. Doesn't mean he's a perfect king. It just means the evaluation of his kingship from the scriptural point of view is that he was good. What makes a good king or a bad king? Well, it's a theological judgment. It's not a political judgment. In other words, it's not an evaluation of his policies. It's not an evaluation of his administration or his reign. It's primarily was he faithful as a king to the Lord God. I want you to hear something real important. Israel's kings were not supposed to be like all the other nations. Remember that from last week? They were supposed to have a king uh, of, their, uh, of, of God's choosing, of God's timing, and according to uh, God's job description. As a matter of fact, the kings of uh, Israel uh, and Judah, or if it had been a completed united empire all the way through, each of the kings should have been known as a, listen to this, Theo monarch, a Theo monarch. The word Theos, we get Theo. Theos means God, monarch means one ruler. And so the idea theologically was God rules the monarch who rules the people. In other words, the king is not out there freelancing. He understands, <clears throat> he is under the leadership of God. And as under the leadership of God, his primary responsibility is to please God by ruling the people in an appropriate God-led sort of way. They were theomonarchs rather than just simply monarchs. So when we evaluate a king, whether he's good or bad, we evaluate him on the basis of theology, not on the basis of politics and so forth. It's not a political one. So you'll read in the scriptures, such and such king did evil. And that tells us he was a bad king. If you ever do a study of the kings of the north or the kings of the south, you'll always want to keep that in the back of your mind. If you will look on the right-hand side of the page, I've listed for you the writing prophets. The writing prophets to be distinguished uh, from the non-writing prophets. Now, what are we talking about? Well, <clears throat> you might recall that there are some prophets 
who did not write biblical books, but yet they had significant ministries in the life of the nation. For example, have you ever read the book of Elijah? No. Or the book of Elisha? No. But they were two of the strongest, most powerful uh, prophets that we have recorded for us in the historical books of the Scripture. But we also have some whom the Holy Spirit would come upon, and in coming upon them, He would guide them into writing precisely what God wanted the nation to have. And it becomes a part of sacred Scripture, which was valuable not only for the day in which it was written, but by way of principle, uh, valuable for all of us. We're reminded once again, not all of the Scripture was specifically addressed to us, Much of it was addressed to Israel, but all of the Scripture, every bit of it, was written for us, for our benefit. We learn by way of principle many valuable lessons of life, many valuable lessons about what God is like and what God desires. We learn that from reading the writing prophets. If you have a heart for social justice, read the prophets. Uh, If you have a heart for just righteousness... Uh, If you have a heart for the poor or the underprivileged, read the prophets and you'll realize that they express the heart of God in these kind of relevant social issues that transcend all of time. So I've listed all of these prophets uh, for you uh, at the top of page 123. At the bottom, as we kind of do our recap, looking back to the movement before us, kingship united monarchy, we recall there are only three kings of a united monarchy, Saul, David, and Solomon. Saul of the tribe of Benjamin. And as I indicated last week, my personal uh, point of view is that uh, the first king should have been King David, but God permissively allowed the people to have a king, and then God chose Saul as the best choice at that point in time. And so we have a little quick listing of those three kings. And as we turn the page, we want to begin with uh, the promises of the Davidic covenant because this covenantal promise begins with King David, but it has a life that goes way beyond King David. It's a very important piece of Scripture, and it sets the stage for much of what we will see in the divided monarchy. Uh, The biblical text is found in 2 Samuel 7, verse 12 to 16, and this is God's prophetic promise to King David. And this is what it says, 2 Samuel 7, verse 12, there on page 124. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, notice, I will. As a matter of fact, four times in this passage, God says, I will. He doesn't say, if you, then I. He says, I will. That's a hint for us that this is an unconditional covenant that God is making with King David and his posterity. When your days are fulfilled, when you lie down with your fathers, when you come to the end of your life, I will raise up your offspring after you, someone from your tribal descent. There will be someone from the tribe of Judah, someone from the lineage of King David, who will come from your body, and I will establish his, key word, kingdom. Every kingdom needs a king, every kingdom needs a realm, and every kingdom needs subjects. You need a king who will rule, you need a realm to rule over, and you need subjects to rule over. And so consequently, God is saying, I'm going to establish a kingdom for you, David. I'll build a house, a dynasty, a lineage uh, for you, for for God's uh, honor and glory. I will establish the throne of his kingdom. Now that makes us remember Genesis 49.10 that about the tribe of Judah, the scepter will not depart from beneath the uh, feet of the tribe of Judah until it comes to the one it belongs to. In other words, ruling authority resides within the tribe of Judah. We're remembering that. God is being faithful to that uh, prophetic promise all the way back to Genesis 49. I'll establish his kingdom forever. I'll be to him a father. He will be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him. Uh, Solomon is going to bear the, the brunt of that uh, in, uh, today. With the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men, my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I uh, put away from before you. Verse 16, <clears throat> I would circle that verse 16. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure... Next word, 
forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Kings may come and kings may go, but the right to rule the kingdom belongs to a descendant of David. Now, <clears throat> what I'd like for you to do is to put your, uh, put your mind into a pause on the united and divided kingdom. And let's think for a moment about one of the prophets during this period, a prophet by the name of Isaiah. And in Isaiah chapter 9, we have a passage that we generally only read at Christmas time, but let me start it for you. Isaiah 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born. Does that sound familiar? Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. Now, do you recall a time when the son, Jesus, ruled or reigned from Jerusalem? I've searched the Gospels, haven't found it. Verse 7 says, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. If there was anything but peace in the first century, he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. That is an Isaiah prophecy speaking of a coming one who must be a descendant of Abraham, who must be a descendant of David, who would then rule over a kingdom forever. It has not happened yet. I would suggest to you it is still waiting. And we're going to tie that in movement 12, the final consummation. But we want to keep that in mind. <clears throat> I have summarized some insights from uh, Dr. Charles Ryrie uh, in the box in the middle of the page. I also, uh, if you look at those uh, five uh, elements, uh, here's what we see. David would have a son who would succeed him. We know that. That would be Solomon. That son, rather than David, would build the temple. That exactly happened. The throne of Solomon's kingdom would be established forever. The throne, the right to rule is established forever. Solomon will not reign forever. Solomon will, in effect, disqualify himself as being one who would reign forever. Uh, only because of God's faithfulness to uh, King David would Solomon be able to maintain a united kingdom. But at his death, the kingdom will split. <clears throat> You'll notice number four, through David's, and this is what Dr. Ryrie says, through David's, uh, though David's sins justified chastening. And I... I can't believe I am correcting one of my former professors. I really think it should read Solomon's sins. If you go back and read verse 14 and 15 in the context of the passage we just read, I think it's clearly referring to Solomon, not David. The truth of the matter, both David and Solomon's sins needed to be, to be chastened, and they were chastened for their sins. But uh, you might just change that, though David and Solomon's sins justified chastening. The point is, God was steadfast in his love and in his promises. Point five, that's the key one. David's house, kingdom, and throne would be established forever. But it's waiting for the one to whom it belongs. And the one to whom it belongs is Jesus. Anytime you're wondering, say Jesus. That's the answer. Now, the biblical implications are important. Notice the, at the bottom of the page. The Davidic covenant does not promise uninterrupted rule. We've had interrupted rule in history. So the covenant is not promising uninterrupted rule. Number two, the covenantal right to rule was a promise from God to David's dynasty, not to David specifically or to his son specifically, but in the unfolding of the covenantal promise to a descendant who is yet to come. Third, the covenant is ultimately fulfilled in the descendant of David, Jesus Christ. Matthew begins his gospel account. The first book of the New Testament, the first of the four gospels, begins with a genealogy. And chapter 1, verse 1 of Matthew's gospel says, it talks about uh, the, uh, this is the, the lineage of Jesus. And then it says he is the son of Abraham and son of David. And then his genealogy proves that he is, uh, he is uh, qualified to be the Davidic descendant. All right, let's uh, look at the top of the next page. <clears throat> Luke 1, verse 31. <clears throat> this is a prophetic uh, promise to Mary. And notice what it says. And behold, you will conceive in your womb. This is what the angel is telling Mary. 
You will conceive and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. There are about seven promises here. He will be great, be called the Son of the Most High. Now notice this. And the Lord will give to him what? The throne of his father David. And he will, number one, reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. When we think of kingdoms, Jesus came and established a kingdom. Uh, some of us believe that the kingdom is, is here, not yet. It is here spiritually and not yet here physically. That those promises made to Israel by the Old Testament prophets will one day be fulfilled in completion and in complete fulfillment of all that God has promised through the covenants and that there will be a day when Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, will rule over a period of unparalleled peace and prosperity where there will be biblical shalom throughout the world as Jesus reigns over the throne of David, over the kingdom of David forever. And that's, <clears throat> that's the viewpoint that we are following in this particular study. And, and if you uh, disagree, by the way, that's, that's fine. You can be wrong. <laughs> Or I could be wrong, or we both could be wrong, but we're all working hard to understand the Scripture. Let's continue. So <clears throat> Solomon is going to be our focal point. The first part of the kingship divided monarchy is the date, 931 B.C., split of the kingdom, and it's built around Solomon. <clears throat> Let's give due to where it belongs. First of all, his accomplishments. He did request wisdom. Notice that. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared or revealed himself <clears throat> to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. I suppose he could have asked for a lot of things. Uh, great influence, uh, greatness of the kingdom, expand his borders, whatever. And, and yet Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast uh, love and faithfulness to my father because he walked before you. Uh, I, I have seen how you dealt with my father. I know the kind of God that you are. The next section, passage, 1 Kings 3, 9, here's Solomon's request. Give your servant, therefore, catch this, an understanding mind. Or, the Net Bible says, a discerning mind. In other words, wisdom to rule and reign. Solomon's request is wisdom. Uh, to rule over a kingdom requires more than human ability. It requires godly wisdom and insight and discernment. So he says, give me this understanding, discerning, wisdom mind to govern your people that I may discern or make judicial decisions concerning good and evil for who is able to govern this great people? The implication is without you, God, leading them. Solomon is lining up in the theomonarchy concept and he's saying, I need your godly wisdom in order that I might lead your people. And to that, thumbs up to Solomon. That's good. He also built the temple. That's good. A permanent tabernacle whereby the redeemed people of Israel could approach their holy God on the basis of sacrifice and separation. That's good. He also built his palace. <clears throat> now we're beginning to see there's some ego in King Solomon. It is a magnificent, powerful palace. Folks, who paid for that? The people. And so we're getting an insight over the ruling and the reigning, the kind of king that he was. To his credit, he did bring the Ark of the Covenant to, uh, to the temple. He placed it inside the temple in the Holy of Holies where it belonged. The uh, Ark of the Covenant was a chest and that, uh, the lid of that chest was the mercy seat and that's where the blood was sprinkled on the Day of Atonement. There was a curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place where there were other articles of furniture. No one but the high priest on the Day of Atonement could go in and perform a ritual or, or uh, what they call sacerdotal or religious duties in the Holy of Holies, except uh, that Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Turning the page, he also expanded, expanded the breadth of the empire. He expanded the wealth of the empire. Uh, his reputation went far and wide. Uh, 1 Kings 10, 23, that second section there, King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. The whole earth wanted to seek the presence of King Solomon. Queen of Sheba came and said, after she saw all of the wealth and the splendor and heard the wisdom of Solomon, she said, I, uh, people haven't said the half of it. I mean, this is incredible and so forth. But he is not defined by his successes. 
He is defined by his failure. Like all the other three kings, he started well, but he finished poorly. And we'll notice uh, his disobedience. 1 Kings 11, 1 to 6. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women. It was the policy of the day. It was the custom of the day. If you were a great king, you would make alliances with tribal empires or confederations by marrying uh, their daughters that would be given to you. They, the daughters would move to the capital city, and uh, you would have many wives reflecting many treaties, many agreements, and so forth. Solomon had many tribes. He's expanded his influence. He's expanded his kingdom. He's also marrying many of these foreign women. Uh, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, and you have a whole grocery list of women that he's uh, uh, marrying and cementing relationships with. Even though in Deuteronomy 17, 17, Moses had instructed before they even went into the promised land, he had, ins he had instructed future kings that you must not take many wives or your wives will lead your heart astray. And as we read about the account of King Solomon, you shall not enter, enter into marriage with them, neither they with you, why? For they will turn away your heart after their gods. And if you'll look at verse 3 in that 1 Kings 11, 1 to 6, he had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines. I'm speechless. I, I, I don't even have the ability for, to talk of the implications of that. And, but here's the important theological point. And his wives did what? They turned away his heart. And so consequently, what Moses had warned against, Solomon has now walked right into. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away, uh, turned his heart away after other gods. And notice the uh, bold type. His heart was not wholly true. In other words, it wasn't fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David was. David was a man after God's own heart. He sinned grievously, but then he repented uh, uh, strongly, uh, brokenly. And so uh, Solomon's heart is not wholly devoted. It's not fully uh, true to the Lord his God. For Solomon followed or went after, number one, Ashtoreth. That's a, a plural form uh, of the goddess of the Sidonians, the Asherah. He went after Melchom, or Moloch in some translations, uh, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon, bold print, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord. And uh, we, as we uh, turn to the next page, we realize that God cannot have a theomonarch whose heart is not devoted to him. He did not allow it with King Saul. Uh, we, it did not happen with King David after the sin with Bathsheba. And so now, 1 Kings 11, verse 9, the Lord is angry with Solomon. Why? Because his heart had turned away. He, as the Net Bible says, he had shifted his allegiance away from the Lord, the God of Israel, that he should not follow after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded. So God said to him this, since this has been your practice, in other words, since this is your attitude, your, heart, your fixed heart attitude, and you have not kept or, or obeyed my covenant and my statutes, I'll tear the kingdom from you. And that's exactly what will happen with his death because of uh, what he has done. Uh, God says that uh, your son will not reign over a united kingdom is the implication. Now, is the Davidic covenant annulled? No. The Davidic covenant is unconditional. But Solomon will not be able to pass on to his son Rehoboam a united empire. Well, he'll pass a united empire, but it won't last long. Look at the bottom of the page. Uh, we have the split of the kingdom is about to occur now with his death. And there are three primary reasons. Number one, there were previous animosities. The north and the south did not get along even in those days. And we understand how that goes. There are some who are still thinking the south's going to rise again. I don't know where they would go, but uh, whatever that case may be, we've had uh, we've had our tr uh, tribal jealousies or, or our regional jealousies. So it's not uncommon for within a united kingdom for there to be differences, jealousies between north and south. Could have been east and west, but in Israel it was north and south. Also, we'll see another reason for that is the personal failures of Solomon. We saw that in our previous discussion. And then thirdly, and then this is going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back, the rash behavior of Solomon's son. 
Rehoboam. So let's turn the page as we get introduced to Rehoboam. As we are looking at Rehoboam and his life, the first thing we need to do is to also bring on to the stage another major character. His name is Jeroboam. He will be known as Jeroboam the first because later in history there will be a second Jeroboam. But this is uh, Jeroboam, an acknowledged leader of that northern confederation. Uh, we made some points about him. He had been recognized as a leader by Solomon. As a matter of fact, in verse 20, uh, 1 Kings eleven twenty six, 26, he was one of Solomon's officials. In other words, he served in Solomon's court in his, uh, in his palace administration. Uh, secondly... Uh, he had had an encounter with a prophet by the name of Ahijah. And Ahijah, when he met him, had a prophetic revelation, took off his cloak and tore it in 12 pieces. And he said, this is about to happen. Speaking of the 12 tribes will become fragmented. And he gave, uh, he gave a prophecy regarding uh, Jeroboam. We'll see it fulfilled here in a moment. Third, he was forced to flee to Egypt when he was under Solomon's reign. He was forced to flee to Egypt probably because he was plotting some palace intrigue. He was probably a usurper who had grand designs on a higher position than Solomon was going to let him have. And so consequently, the, the Scripture tells us in uh, 1 Kings 11.40 that Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam because he was causing trouble and was a usurper and disloyal and so forth. Uh, he eventually, point four, and there, here's a typo in the, in the work, he returned not to but from Egypt. He had uh, to run away from Solomon, he went down to Egypt, but now he returns from Egypt to lead the northern tribe's delegation to confront the son of Solomon, Rehoboam. And 1 Kings 12 tells us a little bit about this. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. In other words, the coronation ceremony is going to be in Shechem, which is about halfway from the Sea of Galilee to uh, Jerusalem. It's right there in the middle, what later would be called Samaria. Right there in that middle kind of ground, that middle ground area between, uh, Mount, uh, uh, between Mount Ebal and Gerizim. I can, in my mind, I can see, see what it looks like there. But uh, they, they have come to that place. Why Shechem? Well, that's where God first appeared to Abram way back in Genesis chapter 12. That's where Jacob settled, one of the patriarchs. Uh, that's where Joseph was buried. Uh, they took the bones of Joseph from Egypt and they buried him at, at uh, Shechem. Uh, that's where Joshua gathered the nation or representatives of the nation between Ebal and uh, Gerizim. And he, he, gave that, he issued that thunderous uh, challenge, choose today whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. All of that happened at this religiously significant site. So this is going to be a coronation ceremony. And as soon as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard about it, he was still in Egypt where he had fled from Solomon. Jeroboam returns from Egypt. And they sent and they called him. And so Jeroboam is immediately appointed the head of the delegation and we have an assembly of Israel, a delegation coming to speak to Rehoboam. And notice verse 4. Here's the complaint of the northern tribes issued to the son of the departed king, asking him for consideration. Point four, uh, verse 4. Your father Solomon made our yoke heavy. In other words, you, he forced us to work way too hard. Now, therefore... Lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke upon us, and we will serve you. In other words, Rehoboam, you're the new king. Your father's policies and your father's accomplishments were made on the backs of the people, our people, the northern tribes in particular. And it was so harsh and so difficult, and the taxation was so heavy, if you will just lighten up, Cut us some slack. That's a Hebrew expression. If you'll just make things easier, then we will serve you as our king. Sounds reasonable. Well, notice point B, the reply of Rehoboam. 1 Kings 12, 5, he said to him, go away for three days. I like that. Let me think about this. You're a delegation. You brought something to me. I'm the new king. Let me think about it. So far, so good. Everybody, so far, so good. Let's look what he does. Subsequently, he consults with the elders who served his father, Solomon. Uh, 1 Kings 12, verse 6 and 7 at the bottom of the page. Then King Rehoboam 
took counsel with the old men. Actually, it means the, 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 the elders, those who had served with his father. He took counsel with them. It reminds me of Proverbs 15, 22. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. To his credit, he is consulting the wise, learned, aged men who had served with his father. And he asked them, how do you advise me to answer these people? And here's what they said with no dissent recorded. They said to him, an if then. If you will be a servant to these people today and serve them, speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. In other words, Rehoboam, if you will recast your role as a king to become a servant leader, not a leader of servants, but if you will become a servant leader and then you will see your responsibility of shepherding your people and serving your people, and if you will speak kind and gentle words to them and acknowledge their complaint and, and respond appropriately, then they'll follow you. And I would even add, and there will be no divided monarchy. Panorama of the Bible will be 11 movements through the Scripture. But let's look and see what happens. Next page. Now, understand, Rehoboam is about 41 years old. We're not talking about a, a teenager. We're not, we're not talking about a kid not wet behind the ears. He's 41. Next page, he consults with his cronies. In other words, the young men he grew up with. They all grew up together, hung out together. But he abandoned, he did not accept the counsel that the elders, the old men gave him. And he took counsel with his young men, his buddies, who had grown up with him and stood before him. And he said to them, what do you advise that we answer this people who have said to us, lighten the, the yoke? What do you think? The young men, verse 10, who had grown up with him said, here's what you say to them. You, you, you lay it on the line. Your father made our yoke heavy, but now you lighten for us. Here's what you're going to say to them. Now catch this. My little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. What? All right. Some translations... My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. Loins are used metaphorically in Scripture often for the reproductive ability of a man. Uh, a child comes from the loins of a man. Are you with me? And now, whether on video or here live, I apologize to all of the ladies. There is a possibility that what the cronies are saying is, is my little finger, actually in Hebrew it says, my little one, my little one is larger than my father's reproductive ability. And so he may not be, re be referring to a finger at all. Are we communicating? Okay. And if that is the case, what he is doing in a very vulgar graphic sort of way, uh, the, the young men may be telling him is, you assert your male prowess and your power and, and, and your new position over the people, and you say, you thought my father was productive, 700 wives, 300 concubines. You think my father was powerful, a, a breadth of a kingdom, the splendor of a kingdom, the building of a palace, the building of a temple. You think that was something in East Texas, you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, and so consequently, their saying is, you tell them, we're not going to lighten it up. In fact, whereas my father laid a heavy yoke, I'll add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I'm going to discipline you with scorpions. A scorpion was a whip that had metal embedded in it, and it caused more, uh, uh, more destruction and was more harmful when used. <clears throat> and so consequently... You, you contrast the wisdom of the elders and the wisdom of the cronies, uh, of his buddies. So what's he going to do? Look at point three. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king said, come to me again the third day. And suddenly I'm, I'm back in Proverbs again. Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool seems right to him, but a wise man seeks advice. And he follows it. 
It's come to me the third day. The king answered the people when they assembled after three days. This is verse 13. They answered the people harshly and forsaking the counsel that the old men had given him. He spoke to them according to the counsel of the young men. My father made your yoke heavy. I'm going to add to your yoke. You thought taxation was bad. You thought forced labor was bad. The conscription was bad. And all of the things that I, my father did, uh, I'm going to now discipline you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord that he might fulfill what he had prophesied, which the Lord spoke by, remember, Ahijah, who tore the cloak in 12 pieces. The Lord had prophetically spoken through Ahijah that the kingdom would split, that the tribes would disintegrate. And in fact, they'll become two factions, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. You'll notice the experience, they experienced the result of the decision. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 16 and 17, when Israel heard that the king wouldn't listen to them, wouldn't follow their advice, their concerns, they said, what portion do we have in, in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, look out for your own house, David. That is more like a battle cry. It's a slogan that will become the rallying point for all of those northern disaffected tribes that they are now seceding from the united empire and they will now establish their own kingship in the north. Uh, I'm from Texas. We had a battle cry that we were all raised on. It was remember the Alamo. And so anytime you say, remember the Alamo, good Texans, remember the Alamo. We don't know why we remembered the Alamo, but we would remember the Alamo. Well, in history, it may have been important to, uh, to the history of Texans, but in this case, it is important to the history of the Israelites in the north. It is a battle cry. What portion do we have in David? To your tents, O Israel. And now the kingdom has split. Turn the page. Rehoboam is not finished with foolish things. 1 Kings 12, verse 18 and 19, he makes a foolish decision. He sends uh, Adoram, who was taskmaster over the forced labor. This is the guy who had been so instrumental in leading the uh, harsh treatment when King Solomon was ruling. And all Israel stoned him to death, basically saying, uh, I thought you got the message when we said to your tents, O Israel, we have no inheritance with King David. They stoned him to death. Rehoboam himself hurries and jumps on his chariot and flees for his life. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day, that is to the date of the, of the writing. And the kingdom has now split. How tragic. How unnecessary. Uh, to be kingly is, is to adopt a different kind of kingship. The problem was, make, give us a king like all the other nations have a king. Well, you got one like all the other nations. With all of the palace intrigue and with all of the selfishness and with all of the, uh, the self-promotion and so forth, you got what you asked for. But you don't have a theomonarch who under God is shepherding God's people God's way. Summary insight in the box. The kingdom had split Israel in the north, Judah in the south. The rupture would not ever heal completely. The Assyrian and Babylonian captivities are on the horizon. As a matter of fact, Israel was never united again until 1948. And uh, we'll be talking a bit about that later on. You'll notice with uh, the middle of page 130, we do a little bit of summary work for you. Uh, the kings of Israel, we've already indicated, 19, all bad. Uh, also, Elijah and Elisha were the non-writing prophets for the northern kingdom. There were others, Amos and Hosea. Uh, all of this is on that page 122 and 123 that we saw previously. We also have the listing of the kings of Judah, 19 kings, one queen. Uh, most were bad, some were good. Uh, we have the primary prophetic voices listed for you there as well. If you will turn to the right-hand side of the page, 131, we want to talk about this whole ministry of prophets in generalities. We might recall that our English Bible is divided in three sections. And notice the shaded section. After the history or narrative, the poetry, the last 17 books of the English Bible are writing prophets. Uh, five uh, major prophets, 12 minor prophets. You'll notice uh, I have taken uh, liberally some ideas from the Zonovan Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible 
in, uh, in trying to summarize the ministry of prophets in the Old Testament. And you will notice the definitions, and I want you to notice point two under definition. It's toward the bottom. Thus in the Old Testament, a prophet would, two things. Number one, a prophet would receive a revelation from God. Somehow, in some way, revelation means God discloses some truth to a prophet who receives it through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And number two, that prophet then passes it on to the intended recipients. So a prophet was one who had received something from God in order to, number two, pass it on to uh, other people that it was intended for. Uh, some of the distinctives, you'll, you'll notice that 300 plus times in the Old Testament the word prophet is used, 150 times in the New Testament. Uh, some of the uh, distinctives point to the very last statement at the bottom of the page. The word rendered prophet or to prophesy generally means the person or the activity of, here it is, receiving God's message, passing on God's message. All right? Here's the thing. Don't think of a prophet as saying, you know, it's really bad around here, so I think I'm just going to stand up and I'm going to take a stand and start preaching. No, prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit. In fact, 1 Peter or 2 Peter 1 tells us that uh, prophets didn't prophesy of their own initiative, but the uh, Holy Spirit came upon them and they were borne along, pushed along, moved along. Uh, as the Spirit was moving them to record prophetic words. And so consequently, they receive divine information, then they pass on divine information. Turn the page. Just something you can look at later. Uh, you'll notice the two boxes. Five ways prophets receive their messages from God. Also, five ways that prophets would sometimes declare their messages. Sometimes they would do it just simply orally or in teaching sections and so forth. I'll let you read those at your leisure. I want you to look on the right-hand side of the page, on page 133, and notice that we have, uh, the, the Scripture tells us that in the, uh, in the revelation of the Bible, there are true prophets and false prophets. That, now listen, folks, that was true back then. That's true today as well. There are true and there are false prophets. So you want to know, well, how do you know a true from a false prophet? And the Bible declares very clearly how you can determine a true prophet from a false prophet. Uh, for example, look at the top of the page. A true prophet speaks in the name of the Lord. So you will see in some of the prophets, you'll see the phrase, Thus saith the Lord. And then they unload the revelation that God gave them and passed it on. A prophet always must speak in the name of the Lord. Number two, a true prophet may, I would put quotes around that, may, doesn't always have to, but he may produce a sign or a wonder that authenticates the fact that he is a messenger, that is to say a prophet, from the living God. And so sometimes in the Old Testament, whether it be an Elijah or an Elisha, you have clusters of miracles, or whether it be Moses and Aaron, Moses was a prophet, as well, uh, you have miracles that authenticate to the audience that this individual indeed was an authentic prophet. Uh, I think I've shared with you before, but I, I think it bears uh, repeating at this point. We see this graphically in the ministry of Jesus. You'll recall in John chapter 3, uh, Nicodemus, the member of the Sanhedrin, the religious leader, comes to Jesus at night. Nick at night. Okay, that's over. We can now get beyond that. All right, Nick at night, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, and this is what he says to him. He says, Rabbi, which means teacher, Rabbi, we know we, the people within his circle, some of the religious leadership, we know that you are a teacher come from God. At which point we would say, well, Nick, how'd you know that? Well, he goes on to give the answer. We know that you are a teacher come from God because of the signs and miracles that you perform. In other words, the miracles authenticated Jesus as a messenger from God. Therefore, the implication is, hear the message. If he's a messenger of God, hear the message that God has for his people. It was true in the Old Testament. It's true in the New. So sometimes miracles, signs, or wonders are, uh, are done to authenticate a messenger. TV timeout. 
there's going to be a day described in the book of Revelation. As a matter of fact, it occurs in uh, Revelation uh, 13. There will be a day when false prophets will perform miracles. So just because a person does a miracle or performs a miracle or appears to uh, perform a miracle does not mean they're a true prophet. That's only one thing to look for. So uh, in that future time of tribulation, false prophets will perform miraculous signs, but their, their message will not line up. We'll get to that in a moment. True prophet may produce a sign or a wonder. Number three, a true prophet's predictions must come to pass. On the scale of, of predicting accurately 0% to 100%, where do you think generously a true prophet ought to fall? You already know the biblical answer. 100. In other words, if you got 99 prophecies right and you missed on the, on the 100th one, you were not a true prophet of God. You were speaking something of your own self. You were not speaking the words of God because the words of God are always made sure. And, uh, and as we saw in the, in the life of Samuel, that God let none of his words fall to the ground. In other words, he all was fulfilled that he prophesied. In the same case, a true prophet of God, whatever he prophesies will come to pass. Back in the 60s, before I came to faith in Christ... I was enamored with a, a, a lady. Her name was Jean Dixon. Any of you old enough to remember a lady by the name of Jean Dixon? Uh, and, and I read her book. Now, I was not a believer, and I was impressed. And when I was in my, in my uh, time where I was just almost there coming to faith in Jesus... One of the guys who was witnessing with me knew that I had a, I, I, I thought it was amazing, some of the things that she predicted. And you know what my friend, the, the Christian, did? He took me to this and said, a true prophet is always right. And I, I can recall now that, oh, so it has to be 100% fulfillment. And that began to take me out of the realm of the Nostradamus or the Gene Dixons or even those who, in the name of Jesus, are making prophecies that don't come about. Beware of those who say, thus saith the Lord, and it never happens. Okay? Uh, they have issued a false prophecy, and they could be then classified as a false prophet. I pray God never impresses on me anything because I, I don't want to put myself out there on that, on that thin ice. A true prophet's predictions must come to pass. Here's the fourth one. A true prophet's message has agreement with all other previous revelation. Another way of saying that is it's in harmony and agreement with the Word of God. In Revelation 13, in that period of tribulation time that's, I believe, yet coming, there will be those who will, pro who will perform miracles, but their message will not line up with Scripture. And only, only those who in that period of time have in some fashion, in some way, begun a process of returning to the Scripture for wisdom and insight will be able to determine a true prophet from a false prophet. And that is in a period of time that is uh, yet on the horizon. So... That's the uh, test of a true prophet. We want to take note of that as well. Now, uh, as I finished out the uh, session, I, let me just hit a few high points. There are five, there are five uh, prophecies or five major prophets. Tr Actually, there are four of them because uh, Jeremiah will also write Lamentations, but five books we call major prophet books. Uh, Isaiah, uh, I've given descriptions of each of these, but Isaiah, you might circle evangelical prophet. You know what we sometimes call the book of Isaiah? The gospel of Isaiah. No other ancient prophecy from the 8th century B.C. has so much information about the coming Messiah, both in his first and second coming, though you don't see it readily in Isaiah, it's there. And so consequently, he's the evangelical prophet. Uh, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. Uh, you have to read his prophecy. He, he, led, he leads a, a stormy, turbulent life, 
and, and weeps and cries over the sin of the people and so forth. He also writes lamentations, which is weeping and lamenting and so forth. Ezekiel is known for the future millennial kingdom. Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48 describes what is in store in the, in the future millennium uh, for Israel in that Davidic covenant uh, fulfillment, that Davidic kingdom. Turn the page. Daniel, we think of Daniel for the times of the Gentiles or the 70 weeks or 77s from uh, Daniel chapter 9, which predicted when the Messiah would show up and that he would be cut off and die. In fact, uh, to the very day, which we will see in a couple of weeks. Uh, I have also listed for you the 12 minor prophets. I might point out to you that between prophet 9 and 10 on page 135, you could put a dotted line between Zephaniah and Haggai because Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are all after the exile. The uh, theologians call it post-exile prophets, whereas Hosea 1 through 9, Zephaniah, are pre or before the exile prophets. And that's a distinction that uh, scholars make on those particular prophets. We will look at Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi in the return from exile. All right? And, uh, and if you uh, turn the page, you'll notice it's a blank chart at the top. And so you're finished, but I want you to look at me. Let's reason together. Let's First of all, let's just look at movements. Movement one, the prologue, Genesis 1 through 11. Movement two, the patriarchs, Genesis 12 to 50 and the book of Job. Movement three, a double movement, redemption and wandering. Uh, Exodus, Leviticus for redemption, Numbers and Deuteronomy for wandering. Movement four, the conquest of the land, Joshua. Movement five, the apostasy, the falling away from the faith, the book of Judges and also the book of Ruth. Movement number six, kingship. United monarchy. We have a transition from the days of the judges. We have two uh, transitional judges, Eli, the old man who will mentor Samuel, Samuel who will anoint the first king of the United Empire, Saul, who will also anoint the second king, David, who will be succeeded, uh, who will succeed, be succeeded by his son, Solomon. Solomon will die in 931 BC. Then we start the kingship divided monarchy. With the death of Solomon and the rash behavior of Rehoboam, his son, and the jealousies, the tribal jealousies, and so forth, the kingdom is split, Israel in the north, until 722 B.C. They will be taken into Assyrian captivity. Judah in the south will continue until 586 B.C. They will be carried away into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. The Babylonians will be defeated by the Medo-Persians. The Persians will allow them to come back from their land in fulfillment of prophecy. And they will return from the exile. During that period of time, in the return of the exile, they'll rebuild the temple. There will be a 400-year uh, period of silence between the, that period of time. And then we'll be introduced to movement number 9, I mean, excuse me, movement number 10, 11, and 12, life of Christ, church age, and the final consummation. All of that is coming. And, uh, we, uh, and we anxiously await to see what God will be uh, telling us and speaking to us on.